Hi, this is Rick Warren, and you're watching Facets Television. I'm Mark Babbitt, CEO and founder of U-Turn, and you're watching Facets Television. Welcome back to AI Med at Dana Point, California. I am Kevin McDonald, and with us is Dr. William Feaster. Dr. Feaster is the Chief Medical Information Officer at Chalk Children's Hospital here in Orange County. Thank you so much for coming in and taking your time oh, to talk with welcome. us. Appreciate it very much. Um, I'm actually enjoying the fact that our local top notch uh, individual is here at the end of our day. So, um, first of all, why don't you tell me a little bit about what you think about how the conference went? Oh, I've enjoyed it. The uh, conference is, this is the uh, second, third day, I guess third day of the conference was Wednesday. We had a couple of workshops on Monday afternoon. We had excellent speakers all day yesterday, ended up with a nice view of the sunset. And on to today where uh, we've continued to have quite a flurry of uh, really leaders in the field of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, people who have done a lot of work in medicine with analytics and healthcare. That's terrific. So. Um, as the Chief Medical Information Officer at Chalk, what type of leveraging of AI are you currently doing today? Well, what we're primarily doing right now uh, is uh, leveraging our patient data internally uh, and applying data science tools to it. You can call it artificial intelligence if you want, but basically data science to study the reasons that patients are readmitted to the hospital, uh, the reasons that people are not fully satisfied with care, and lots of other clinical questions that come up. We're also looking at uh, data from children who develop venous thromboembolism in the hospital, okay. and we have systems to try to prevent it, and we want to make sure those systems are working effectively. Uh, Chalk has a long history of uh, using technology, particularly information technology, to uh, reduce uh, patient harm and to improve quality of care. We've had all kinds of awards uh, along those lines for our work. We have had a fully computerized patient record beginning in 2002, so we now have 14 game. years worth of data and 14 years of experience working with these systems to improve care. So, um, for example, one of the things just over the last uh, five or six years, uh, we, you know, it, patients, uh, when they enter a hospital, it, are always at risk of harm. And you ideally don't want to ever harm a patient. Mm -hmm. That's really not what they're there for. That's not why we're there. But things will inadvertently happen. Mm -hmm. Well, our risks, our actual incidents of harm, the things like patient falls, uh, decubit eye ulcers, things like that. It isn't patient death, but it's things that happen to patients, wrong medications, et cetera, mm -hmm. has decreased tenfold in just the last uh, five years. That's amazing. Uh, and that's all, well, other than we have great people. It's also the application, the proper application of technology. It's not so much artificial intelligence yet as it is just hard work taking data and using data to improve care. So uh, you were one of the presenters here. Yeah. What did, uh, what did you get to share with the audience? Well, we've done, the, in the first day, we had actually two workshops. The first workshop was on um, a, a working together of clinicians working together with data scientists. Mm -hmm. Data scientist is someone's trained in everything from statistical analysis, statistical inference, as well as um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other tools, uh, a lot of the current tools uh, that are used today in a very high-tech way to analyze data. And we hired a, a machine, uh, we hired a uh, data scientist about a year ago, and he and I have been diligently working on projects together. So we did a presentation, a few other people as well, 
led the presentation where we wanted to talk to data scientists about what it's like working on clinical projects. My particular presentation was on the uh, security and privacy issues of data under HIPAA. And that is a pretty big eye-opener to someone who hasn't started to work with medical data before because uh, it really restricts what you can do with data. There's a lot of value in the identified data. And so until we are able to uh, to really work together on problems, uh, and not just chalk working on a problem, but chalk and five other children's hospitals or 50 other children's hospital, like in the iSpy network that we're creating, until that happens, it's going to be a barrier for true uh, advances. Um, doesn't mean we can't make progress. And we're already starting to make progress uh, using these types of tools. Uh, but we'll have even more progress when we can share data as well and work together for a common goal. Okay, I, um, I'm going to going to say thank you for, for taking the time to talk with us this evening, but I also want to invite you right now to come back uh, and have a deeper conversation because I'd love to hear about the ISPY project and some of the other things that are going on at Chalk, but I do want to thank you for taking the time to come and talk with us this evening. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You've been watching Facets TV. We are here at AI Med in Dana Point, California, and we hope you'll come back. And we're back at AI Med in Dana Point, California. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Facets TV. And with me now is Enrico Coyera. He's a PhD, an internationally recognized leader in digital health, and the 2015 IMIA Francois Grimmy Award of Excellence recipient. Thank you so much for coming in. It's a I pleasure. I appreciate your taking the time. Um, so I understand you're one of our presenters today, and uh, would really like to understand a little bit about what you're presenting on. Sure. So I'm very interested in what the technology means for clinical care and how that shapes the world that we live in as clinicians or, or patients. And there's a lot of talk at this conference around the technology, mm -hmm. but not so much talk about what it's like to work with it, what are the impacts of the technology. Okay. So from, from that perspective, do you mean that the uh, infrastructure that makes the technology possible or the artificial intelligence engine? What are you describing in that? Yeah, so I'm very interested in what it's like to be a, a doctor or a nurse who has this new assistant working with them, giving them give advice, making predictions. How does that shape your world? Mm -hmm. Does that make care better or worse? So, okay. yeah. So a good example um, from the non-clinical world is we're all familiar with the guy who was watching Harry Potter while his Tesla was on autopilot and crashed and killed. So mm -hmm. that's what we would call automation bias. That means I'm trusting the technology beyond its limits. And that's, that's a, something that's going to be quite common with, with AI medicine because this is great but not perfect technology. And it's too easy to rely on it when it becomes convenient, right? Well, we, we, you know, yeah, we become complacent. Yeah. So from that perspective, what do you think the, the biggest ethical challenges are in the use of AI in medicine? Well, I don't know if there are ethical challenges. I think the deep challenges are for us to become expert in understanding this technology. So mm -hmm. if you're going to be a, um, a doctor in radiology, you understand your, your machines very well. If you're in intensive care, you understand your monitors very well. Mm -hmm. um, we need to understand the limits of these technologies as much as we have to understand our own limits as humans. So from that side, what do you think currently is the largest limitation of the technology? Oh, well, I think today the technology is... Um, amazing in what it does but it is also very narrow in what it does so we build machines that are very precisely good at answering a single class of question whether it's a diagnosis or a, or a treatment thing there's no such thing as general purpose ai you're not going to have a discussion um, right. with this thing you know siri after you talk to her for a sentence or two runs out of things to say right right so so with that um assumption do you believe that AI will ever become intuitive in medicine? Uh, so I think AI, um, if, if you are the guy who is driving it and you know why you're asking the question or it's prompting you at a point where it makes sense, then it is intuitive. It doesn't become intrusive. Um, but that's about designing systems that fit workflow and really solve real people's needs. Uh, one of the things I often say is that, you know, we need to be driven by the problem, not by the technology. And so as long as we're driven by real clinical needs and real clinical problems, it's always going to be unintrusive because it's the right place for it. So where do you think we're going in the next five years? I mean, 
from a technology perspective? Yeah. So look, you know, this is the third AI boom, and we've had a couple of AI winters in between. And um, I think what's happening now is, is really impressive, which I would call it the industrialization age. So we're able now to build things using massive data sets in hours or days mm -hmm. that uh, 20 years ago we could have built, we still could have built those systems, but it would have taken us two to three years. Mm -hmm. So we've gone from a cottage industry to, to really, you know, kind of the Victorian era. Is there going to be a challenge in containing the potential for AI, meaning, you know, what are the negatives, if there are any? Yeah, I, I think that's what I was talking about with automation bias. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we know from studying information technology in healthcare, it's one of the things we look at, is that we introduce new risks and new harms. And we know that, you know, the EHR has made things better, but also pe people have died because of the alerts. Yep. Uh, so um, you need to make sure that when your AI comes in, it's going to make things better. But you also have to be wise and realize that there are going to be patients that are going to be harmed now that were never harmed before. So from that side also, I, I know that, that the HR also has been a challenge in that if you get falsely integrated or data lack of data integrity, you start to have issues as well because Absolutely, you're yeah. relying now on no longer the memory of the doctor knowing the patient. It's all about the system accurately knowing the patient. That's so right. Do you see that same problem coming as we get bigger and bigger out into the AI world? or? Uh, absolutely. I, I just think in the end, you know, the other thing to remember is that people love to subvert the system. And so the clinicians will develop workarounds and they'll ignore the AI if it doesn't suit them. Right. Um, you know, going back to the HR, one of the biggest problems today is cut and paste, yeah. where people are saving time by copying yesterday's records. You know, yeah. uh, that was designed as a feature for good, but, you know, we now know there are harms associated with with that little yeah, work both around. from accusations of billing fraud and from medical errors. Absolutely, right? yeah. So that's definitely a challenge yeah. for sure. Yeah. So we won't really know how this is going to play out. We won't know the way people are going to subvert or adapt to the technology, and just as we don't know how far the technology will go. But but both are going to be really important in the outcome. So what drives you every morning when you wake up to keep going on this? What, what is it that's so exciting about it? You know, the beauty of working in this area is that if you get it right, you're going to help thousands of millions of people you know and as a clinician you know you'll work your heart out and you'll do a few patients a day mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it means the rewards are few and far between but if you get it right it has a big payoff so um from your own practice perspective if you were able to ask for anything what would you ask for Oh, I'd love a lot more research funds. That's kind of an obvious answer, isn't it? Well, but except for that it's not just the... Re well, let me, and let yeah. me correct the question. Yeah. Um, is it more people? Is it more money? Is it more advanced technology? Is it all of the above? Okay, if, you, if you're going to say what is the most critical resource we're missing, I would say it's people who have dual training, sort of MD, PhDs, or nurse PhDs, people who understand the clinical world, and the world of, of AI or data science or computer science. Because so you see an advanced career opportunity also for people if they start focusing now. Absolutely. Right? Um, so when I started out, there were probably were 20 MD, PhDs uh, in the world mm -hmm. uh, in, in artificial intelligence and medicine. Um, hopefully today that's now in the hundreds, but we probably need them in the tens of thousands. Yeah, and this so. is the first symposium, so maybe um, this is where we start, right? Having a a group conversation about something that's no longer in the silos of each one's practice that's right. in your own little research lab. If you're talking about interdisciplinary, this yeah. is it. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for coming to talk with us. I very much appreciate it. It's my pleasure. You've been watching Facets Television here at AI Med in Dana Point, California, and we hope you'll keep watching. Welcome back to AI Med in Dana Point, California, and you're watching Facets TV. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with us is Jack Poe. Jack is actually a product manager working in Google in the medical brain and health cloud. He's also done work with the search unit. He received his MD and PhD from Columbia University in biomedical engineering and his master's degree in mathematics from Johns Hopkins University, and he is our guest today, and we are honored to have him here. Thank you, Thank so you very much, much for inviting me here. In. Oh, no, it's going to be great. So, um, You've, you are one of the presenters here at the event, but first I want to get into a little bit of the background of what's it like working in Google in such an amazing environment dealing with such important things, I guess would be the question I would start with. Yeah, I think there's a lot of amazing things happening at Google. Uh, we have, obviously, incredible machine learning scientists uh, paired with uh, one of the largest uh, banks of data anywhere. And 
many of us are obviously interested in health. Mm -hmm. We think this is a very large lever where a number of us can make very significant impact. And Google has always been the business of organizing the world's information. Uh, we've uh, done that on the web, and I think we're also very interested to see if we can really make a difference in health. So one of the things like that, that drew me to the, uh, the idea that I was going to get the chance to interview you is I was a very, very, very early user of Google. I'm talking, yeah. I did a radio show. This is an interesting, I did a little radio show where I would take any question before yeah. people knew that Google existed. So I was able to do the type. Nice. And it was fun to do, but w the reason I reference it is Google has come so far, right? Now with AI concepts and now in AI and healthcare, w do you have... Do you have an imagination or, or sort of a, a vision of where it's going? So I think we have uh, a, no, a, a number of the tech companies, I think, have had very strong visions of where AI can start uh, applying in the consumer space. Mm -hmm. I think you can see a lot of very interesting devices like Alexa, like Google Home, uh, where we think we can start to have conversations with humans uh, and really give interesting information. Uh, on the health side, we see a lot of similar challenges uh, we see there's a lot of information that's very hard to condense. There are a lot of patients who are looking for information. We already know that from Google search that a lot of patients are looking at information. Uh, on the search side, there's been a lot of work done, both on the generic search side and on the health search side, mm -hmm. to really start to give information to users who are looking for uh, health-related information that are relevant to them and that are uh, more uh, appropriate for them. Right, so Google has been talked about in the past where if you search headache, there are a lot of things that come up around cancer. While cancer are, can potentially cause headaches, mm -hmm. that obviously is not the most common. Right. So there's a lot of work that the health search team has done to really try and help with some of those issues. On the AI side, we've started to look at can we really use deep learning to make predictions that are uh, helpful potentially on a patient's trajectory. Mm -hmm. So this recent JAMA paper uh, recent paper that we put out in a medical journal was talking about if we had a large number of medical images, uh, we are starting to see evidence that, for example, in diabetic retinopathy, uh, we can start to make predictions that are of very high quality. Based on imaging? Based on medical imaging. Interesting, okay. And so, from, so let's talk about <coughs> that a little bit because we have a couple of challenges there. We have one, the data processing then we have the data storage, which is, of course, the interesting um, hard part for many because of the cost, not yep. Google, but most, <laughs> right? Um, and then, of course, how do you narrow that down to relevant data, I mean, or relevant knowledge, because it's so complicated and mixed up. Um, are, are you writing custom, are you folks writing custom algorithms that allow that, or is that being done by the teams as, as human beings right now, or where is that going? Yeah, so I think that's one of the interesting things. So I did my... Uh, PhD on computer vision on radiology data. Okay. And at the time, we as a community was very focused on figuring out what things are relevant mm -hmm. and then building models from those things that are relevant. So that's what's basically called feature engineering. So the really cool part about deep learning is that if you just put all the data, as much data as possible, into the model, you don't actually have to figure out what's relevant a priori. And the models are able to figure out what are the important things in the model and to make those predictions. Now, is that because of a frequency issue? I mean, what do you think is, uh, how does that, because I'm not an AI person, I understand yeah. it fundamentally, but um, is it because of the frequency of a particular thing or is it because there are cross-references happening? I mean, what, what would be the... Yeah, it's really, a, 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 I think, we think of it as a very disruptive uh, innovation uh, that has come about in the last uh, five years. The technology, the concept has been around for decades, mm -hmm. but only recently has the ability to process those models gotten to a point where you can really actually apply them. Mm -hmm. So we've seen incredible gains using deep learning internally at Google. Uh, we've seen them in some products like Google Photos, where we, on the commercial side, on the mobile phone side, you can actually uh, see the result of these AI automatically already. Um, on the medical imaging side, we've seen similar gains in performance that we can do. Uh, these models are just so incredible in the way that without us really figuring out what are the important characteristics a priori, they can just make these predictions. And we've That's done that on YouTube data, on imaging data, and now on medical imaging data. So, and then does it extend also to the potential for an EHR? So you're doing it in imaging, which to me is one of the more difficult ways, places to do it, right? And, and to a certain degree. 
are you looking to apply that same benefit from pools or lakes of data from an EHR, for example? Yeah, we would love to uh, investigate that. I think on the imaging side, it's actually much easier for us because we've had so much work that's already been done Prior in that area. Right, yeah. uh, EHR data is uh, something we don't have a lot of experience with. Uh, there's a lot of deep learning literature right now that's going around trying to apply some of those concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not yet clear whether that really uh, works or not. And I think there are a lot of excitement in the community about mm -hmm. what the potential that could happen if this th the technique was really applied to a lot of data. So with someone with your background, I'm, I'm imagining it might be difficult to get excited about things because you've seen so much already. So what is it that is exciting you right now about the, the whole concept of AI? Yeah, so I consider myself a tech geek, so I'm actually frequently excited. Oh, okay. Well, that's good uh, to hear. I'm glad that you can continue to... Because <laughs> to, 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 I know it would be hard once you've done really great things. It's kind of how do you get excited about something not so great? You know? Yeah, so in this case, I'm actually tremendously excited. I think the uh, not just us, I think a number of folks who have published on deep learning has really shown superhuman uh, accuracy at this point on deep learning results. Mm -hmm. uh, the holy grail of medicine has always been that uh, we don't do feature engineering, that you can look into every data point of a person, mm -hmm. th this is a kind of a prelude to personalized medicine, yep. and be able to predict what's going to happen next, be able to recommend interventions. I think that is definitely something that you know all of us who work in machine learning would love to get to. Uh, and I think that vision is tremendously exciting to me, both as a computer scientist and as a clinician who would love to see this actually being applied. So, uh, you know, ever since I was a kid, I kind of made the connection that we're just machines, right? I mean, uh, we really are. We're yeah. electrically based. We've, you know, we've got chemical interactions or reactions causing everything to go. Um, so I can see where AI would be incredibly powerful in predictive nature when you look at the human nature is kind of the same. We all have similar genes and so on. Yeah. Uh, where do you think the biggest innovations are going to come in the next five years? I mean, from your view of where you are in the world. Yeah, so we're seeing very exciting things happening on the consumer space. Okay. Um, I think a lot of the folks in the press are talking about Google and Amazon and Microsoft fighting it out on AI. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually very exciting for all of us in the field because it's pushing all of us to be much better. Yes. You can already very quickly see on Google Translate and, uh, and frankly, Microsoft Translate that the translation results have gotten much better. And we've heard from many folks in healthcare that they've started to use it directly with patients who don't speak English. Yeah. Uh, and that's already been very exciting. Uh, a lot of these things that are happening on the consumer space very directly can be applied on the healthcare space. Um, we, uh, I think all three of these companies now have various efforts on healthcare because mm -hmm. uh, we all deal with it ourselves in our personal lives. We're starting to see these Internet of Things sensors uh, being tremendously disruptive on the consumer side. Uh, we would obviously love to introduce some of the application into healthcare. So let me ask that, that brings me to my next question, which is if we have all of these attached sensors, whether they're implantables or attachables or wearables, whatever it might be, yep. um, and are, do you see a time when I can go personally without calling a doctor and enter it into a Google AI engine and say, here's all my today, my daily results and get back a, you know, you might know, to g you might need to go see a doctor. Do you see that coming um, in the future? I don't know whether it'll be us or someone else. I think all of us would love that vision. Um, I think as a clinician, we all really believe that patients should have control of their data. Uh, patients ultimately should be able to learn mm -hmm. about their own past. Uh, make predictions on what's going to happen with their own data. I'm not sure how well that, uh, whether that vision will actually happen in five or ten years, mm -hmm. uh, but I think a lot of us are starting to look, uh, work on the techniques that can be applied when that happens. That's fantastic. Um, how much time have you been able to spend here at the conference? Have I was here during the entire conference. Okay, so what did, did you walk away with anything really particular like, wow, did you have any aha moments that were just you know going to send you home doing something new? Yeah, I think there were a few things that were very exciting to me. Uh, one, I think it's it's been a long time uh, where computer science have been trying to influence clinicians. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the really incredible things that, that I saw at this conference was there were actually a large number of clinicians that not only were engaged, but they are really starting to try deep learning themselves. Okay, all right. Uh, and are starting to apply it in their own clinical environments. Uh, the other thing that was very exciting to me was the very clear patient engagement that I typically don't see in conferences in general, but even 
uh, amongst uh, patients. Mm -hmm. The patients increasingly want their data. Uh, patients very much want these predictions to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, patients are now frequently Googling or going to other data sources, finding out a lot of information, and quite frankly, uh, sometimes finding out information that the clinicians overlooked. It's happened to me more than once. Yes. It has happened to me more than once using Google. So yes. yes. And I think, you know, this wave of momentum that is currently happening is tremendously exciting for all of us in this field. So from that perspective, I think what I like what you pointed out, which is the reversal, because many of the doctors that I've spoken to in the last decade have this concern they're, be they're somehow being displaced by technology, whereas I, th I see now maybe they're starting to understand, no, 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 it's the exact opposite. Yeah. You're being, you become more important um, as it, because you're the one that can guide how this technology gets improved and how it gets created. Yeah. And I think that's a hugely valuable thing. Um, what do you think the biggest limitations are? Because you have a view of the world being inside Google, knowing what's, cap what's possible, right? You get the, the biggest equipment, the biggest yeah. investment. What do you think the limitations are? What can be done to help um, lower those limitations? I think there are a lot of processes right now that are very... Um, I think many challenges are not technological at the moment. So we have very little ability as, a, a, as, as citizens in the U.S. to get our own medical data. Mm -hmm. um, we That's an ownership question currently. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that also means that those folks who are interested in building models very rarely have access to the data they need to build models. Um, I think there's also right now a lot of confusion on what models to actually build and what models are relevant. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are, I think, clinicians are starting to really help in that conversation, but it would be great if a lot more clinicians enter that conversation to talk about, these are the things that we really need help with. Mm -hmm. These models are interesting, but you should be working on these models instead. So we in, in the cybersecurity world have significant challenges finding talent. Um, if you were to give advice, because there's nothing wrong with making a good living in the computer industry, yes. like, and I can attest to that. So. <laughs> um, what do you? Uh, what can you tell the young people out there making decisions? What what things should they do to start moving down the line to be one of those people in the future? Yeah, I think deep learning. I think is very very exciting, but deep learning is just one technique in machine learning. Uh, there are many many techniques that currently are uh, very interesting in making predictions and other things. Uh, I really am quite supportive, and Google is very supportive of doing STEM education very early on in, in uh, different folks' careers. Uh, we also have our own brain residency program at this point, mm -hmm. which reach out and teaches folks to do machine learning oh, by bringing folks externally to Google for a year uh, and then you know, sending them Pushing back to the back home, out. home oh, institutions. Okay. Uh, we've also open sourced a lot of, of code, not, not just us. I think Facebook have started to open source codes and Microsoft has started open source codes because all of us realize that we uh, use the open source community to help us bootstrap quite a bit and it's time to also contribute back to the open source communities and really make these tools available and make the entire community collaborate on some of these technologies that frankly will not just be disruptive in healthcare but disruptive in many things. And, and it really, I mean, AI by definition is a community project, right? I mean, it really is. The more yep. data, the more points of information we get, the better it is. Well, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. It's thank been you very fascinating much. It's great and to talk to I you. hope that we have a chance to talk again in the future. Yep, absolutely. Thank, thank you. you so much. You've been watching AI Med at Dana Point, California. This is Facets TV. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with us has been Dr. Jack Poe, and we're out.